Daiku for about 40 years. Daiku is a Japanese name for carpenter. Uh, I happened to run into a Japanese carpenter do a demonstration. I've never seen anybody work with such strange tools and do the kind of joinery that he does. Um, What's happening this weekend with the Japanese carpenters coming over? There's some really excellent top of the line carpenters that do all the excellent work in Japan. Uh, the thing that's promoted all these pre industrial tools is that they, uh, all the historic buildings in Japan have to be repaired and maintained, but they can only use the tools they had at the time when the building was made. So we're talking about buildings that were, you know, 1,200, 1,500 years old. So they didn't. Sometimes they didn't even have saw. So it was all. They know that because they can go back in the building and look at all the bookmarks and the edge marks and the scratching and tell what kind of tools they had. So the guys that are coming over have all been trained in those ways of working. In Japan, there are people that do, uh, you know, Western kind of nails and computer stuff and all that. But these guys are really special because they've trained for a long time to be able to be the masters of these kind of tools. So these tools were set up to uh, do joinery. Joinery is a uh, wood to wood connection. Uh, in Japan, these joints, if you're making two pieces or more that fit together, they're not glued or screwed or nailed or bolted together. Uh, part of that reason is because when these joints were developed, they didn't have screws, they didn't have glue, they <laughs> They only used what they had, but the problem was is that they solved a lot of earthquake problems because when, when you got joinery together, it fits good. In an earthquake, when the building shakes, instead of the building falling apart, the, the joinery lets the building move a little bit in that joint without having structural failures. So, you know, it's really an ingenious way to work. Uh, it's really a lot of fun. Um, I brought a selection of things here. First, I want to talk about kind of the tools. Uh, their chisels and look different than what a Western chisel looks like. Mostly, uh, the main difference is that the cutting edge is, is two pieces of steel that are welded together, forged welded together. Uh, Western carpenters, tool makers used to do this back in probably up until the 1850s when uh, the accountants took over the tool making business and they, what we make now is called the drop forge, which means it's either cast one piece or it's stamped out with a big heavy stamp. And it's one piece of metal. This is two pieces of metal, very high carbon piece of steel and a low carbon piece that's the background, the back piece that holds it all together. So that's what takes the shock. The hard steel uh, is much harder than Western steel and it wouldn't hold up if the whole chisel was made out of that because it's too brittle. But it makes an excellent cutting edge. So it was about the uh, 1300s in Japan when they consolidated the country into a country and uh, Kyoto was the capital. So the head warlord made all the other warlords come into Kyoto and build residences and places because what he would do is he would kidnap the family of the other warlords and keep them in the town while the other guys were gone so that they didn't have a rebellion. And so they had to build all this. So part of it was instead of having all these standing armies, they had to convert a lot of these car the guys into carpenters. And the superiority of the tools that they made came from the samurai sword from the samurai blades, the lamination, all the tempering and all that. So a lot of the people that made the samurai swords were mandatory converted into making chisels and plain irons and saws and those kind of things because they had the technical expertise to do that. So they had chisels from a long time. Most of I mean the Japanese were building buildings for a long time but they weren't very sophisticated. It only became more sophisticated than what we kind of think of as is the Japanese architecture at this point when the Buddhism came into Japan from China and Korea. So they had a lot of propaganda in these buildings which were so monumental and huge, they're still mind-boggling today when you go to Japan and see these things. You, to me it's always a wonder how they could have 
even made up all the wood. They didn't have chainsaws. They didn't even, you know, it's like, you're going to see this tomorrow. That's what some of these guys do. Because again, when they go back to do these buildings, they can't use a, a wood miser to cut their logs down. They got to do it the old way. So some of these guys are really expert in using broad axes and, and hewing and splitting. And that's a lot of where they came from. So they had chisels when they lam started laminating and making them like this. That really was a superior way. Because when you're doing things by hand, you, you got to be much more efficient. Right, because all the energy is coming out of you. It's not like you push a button and a machine does all these incredible things. You push your own button and you got to learn to do these, all these things. So they had chisels, they worked those out. Um, Japanese plane, it's a very simple looking tool. It's a wooden block of a die with a blade. It's a laminated blade like the chisel. Uh, this is a small one I've made. These, they come in different sizes. Uh, tomorrow you'll see people that are expert in using these wide beams. These are beam planes, which in their building a temple, they've got a post that's this big. They have a plane that big. They clean the plane off. They plane that beam off with one plane stroke. Usually you're using a smaller plane making multiple passes, right? I mean, that's how Westerners do it. That works too, but in the temple building, you're working for a higher authority, I guess, you know, so you have to get a little more perfect on things. So tomorrow there's a whole bunch of guys that are experts in using plain, big wide planes, and I think Kami Joe's even got some that are bigger than this. So it's really a treat to see these guys, uh, these guys work. So before they had planes, they, the trees, they would cut the tree down with an ax, they would split it with wedges. Uh, a lot of splitting took place, because again, back then they had, primo trees because nobody could cut the trees down so they could go through and pick out these really beautiful straight grain trees which they could split fairly easy. So once they split them, they, they used a, an ad called the Chono, which the guy will be here tomorrow on Saturday, adding off some of the rough stuff. Then after it was rough, kind of smoothed off. They got a really nice texture with the ads. And then after the adding was done, you get the smoother, the smoother surface. They used a tool like this called the Yarigana, which is a spear plane. So, I mean, again, you can see somebody in the war had a stock with a spear plane on the end. Oh, that's pretty sharp. So it's used as a, it's used for flattening. You don't get a flat surface like a plane iron because you don't have a flat surface. You get a really nice texture on, on the wood with this. And this was what they finished up the... That's what they finished up the, uh, that's what they finished up the grain with because it wasn't flat, right? So today we've got machines that flatten it, you can sand it, I've got planes, I've got planes that make wood feel like a piece of glass. This I use because it puts a nice texture in it. So it's used like a, right, you can go in both ways. So you can get it pretty flat, but it's not a real flat surface. It's got a real nice texture that picks up the light in it. So this is a really old tool before they had planes. And probably around the 10 or 1100s, they developed the Japanese plane, which is a pool plane, as opposed to the Chinese plane, which they got the idea from, which had sticks coming out the side and was a push plane, more like a Western plane. Right? So they developed all this, and then you got it you got a much more control, you got a really nice sharp blade, and the bottom is conditioned to a point where you have gliding surfaces. So this gliding surface determines the, net, the plane that the blade cuts on, right? This is called the plane because you're setting up a flat plane surface. That's the idea of the plane. It's in a block. It could be a chisel in here that was sharp, but this is a blade that's set up on these two gliding surfaces to give you a perfectly flat surface. That's why the plane is called the plane, because you're making that plane, right? Called the Kana in Japan. That was later on, and it wasn't probably till the 14th or 15th century that they got expert enough to make saw blades that were this thin, that would hold up an edge and be flexible enough not to bend. The blacksmithing to make a piece of steel like this, to me, is still hard to imagine. I mean, you've got a hard edge blade here that holds a sharp edge that cuts wood, but it's got to be flexible enough to not snap. 
So you've got two things going on there, which are you know, the opposite of each other, but somehow they've got it to work out. So it's that way. So this is a kind of a small or size saw for cabinet making. So the tools are usually in the size and proportion to the size of wood you're working on. If you're working on big timbers, you got big saws. So it's different than our way of working because the saws all have different, you got different size saws for bigger pieces. Right? If you're sawing, you know, if you were working on a beam that was that big, you'd use a bigger saw. So these saws are unique in that they have two sets of teeth. They're cross cut, rip, rip teeth. You need that for cutting joinery. So if you're sawing off, you saw cross grain means that you're sawing this way, right? Because that the grain is going this wrong way. Big teeth are for sawing in the rip cut, which is sawing with the grain. So when you're making joints, you've always got to go both directions. So that's kind of you know, if you're sawing off a tin that looks like this, you've got rip cuts going this way, then you've got cross cuts that go that way. So you've got two saws in one. So that, you know, there's a big advantage to that. These saws, again, uh, the size of them depends on the size of the lumber that you're working on. This is called a Ryoba. It has two sets of teeth. Uh, this is an FDP saw, which is a Ryoba. It has curved teeth. This was the first saw design that they made. And the main difference is that the, the edges were curved and it had different size teeth, different profile on the cutting edge of the teeth. Most Western saws, cross cut are actually rib teeth. The Japanese cross cut is a knife edge that's sharpened on three sides and then the top point of it, the third side, has a, a cut on it which is like a marking knife that gives you a very clean, clean cut. This is a, called a tate biki, which is a real big saw for cutting big timbers, sawing rib cuts. Right? So if we were sawing in the end of this piece, If you had to saw the tenon in this piece, you'd use the saw part of it like this. So again, they all kind of work the same. They all, you know, kind of made the same. Different makers have different ways of doing it that give them special features. Um, these things are extremely sharp. That's one of the first things you really learn to teach yourself when you start messing with these things is that it's like playing with rattlesnakes. Like the thing you know you've got some blood to come out. So these things come in a lot of different sizes. A little smaller one for more delicate kind of work. So each one of these it has a different sweep in it, gives you a different surface on the wood because of the curve that's in this. Uh, so these these chisels that I have here are cabinet size chisels. Uh, this one is about a quarter of an inch in width. They go down to, where is that one skinny guy? Uh, this is about an eighth. It's about a quarter. They go all the way up to big sizes. Uh, there's you know, a really bigger one. But again, they're all made the same with the lamination and two pieces of steel. So these are cabinet uh, size. When you get into bigger pieces, you get bigger chisel. They start to look more heavier, heavier handles, bigger, you know, more weight to them. You use a bigger hammer because you're hitting on bigger, you're hitting on bigger tools. Um, they also have these kind of chisels that are called tsukinomi or paring chisels, which are for cleaning up after you've chiseled and sawed. You clean your surface up with a chisel like this. Same laminated blade. You don't hit this with a hammer. This is all for cleanup work by hand. So this kind of chisel goes again in all kinds of styles. You know, it's too big things like this into real smaller things. So again, these are all pre-industrial tools and crafts, which again have been maintained because all this stuff, all the joiner still works. Uh, now in Japan, a lot of the companies have CNC machines and they do all this with a computer and you know it's all they were like the pioneers on prefab and modular construction. All their houses and all their historic buildings are all in a module and they're all made in a shop and the pieces are taken and assembled on site. 
Most of the time, the, the people that put the building together aren't the people that made the joints. So it's really a fastidious, compulsive kind of culture to be able to get all these people together to make things fit, right? Because it's amazing how much it comes off of each person doing things. So we got saws, uh, we got up to chisels, the other tools that we had, uh, we have the yardagana, which is the old plane, the old size. What you use for uh, all their marking out for the pencils is this kind of device called the Tsubo. Tsubo is the ink pot, and it has sumi ink in it on raw cotton. And uh, it's used for laying out all the, all the lines in the corner. Uh, it's got indelible black ink. Sumi ink is a pure carbon process. They make that ink out of, they take like a kerosene lamp sort of thing and they burn it so it smokes a lot and they collect that soot. So it's the soot off of burning, I don't know, linseed oil and things like that. And it's that soot that you don't want on your kerosene lamp, but that's what they, they save and that's what they make the ink out of. So this, uh, has a crane and a turtle, which are the two totems of the carpenter. Uh, cranes made for life and turtles live a long time, so that's kind of the mentality of the symbolism of the carpenter's work. So it has the, the raw cotton and the ink, and then you put a little water on it. It has an ink line that goes in that winds up on this wheel in the back. It's like a chalk line, but it's all done in ink. This is called the sumasashi. This is a piece of split bamboo. Uh, it's sharpened to a point on one end for marking and writing, and then the other end is split like a quill pen and sharpened to a nice clean edge. And that gives you the thickness of your layout line. So, by sharpening this and getting this flat, and then you've got this is split. just by working it out, <coughs> splitting a little head. So the ink gets in between those pieces and that's what holds the ink that feeds the line. So the other thing that's fairly unique, this is a traditional square. I mean, this was made out of stainless steel. In the old days they made it out of copper. Uh, the measurements the Japanese traditionally used were based on a measurement this big, which is called the shaku. It's a sixteenth of an inch longer than, a, than an inch. That dimension is divided into tenths, which is subdivided into tenths. So it's like an engineer square. Engineers don't use fractions, because fractions don't have always have an equal, there's always some weird stuff in there with fractions, right? So this is a ten scale. So when you're measuring and adding up your measurements, it's like counting money, right? So it's, you've got a boo, which is a tenth of a soon. You've got ten soon, which ten soon make a shaku, right? So, what measurements you use doesn't matter. To, when you do a joinery, it's a proportion. And I found that this works really good because you work in whole numbers and you're not dealing with one and three sixteenths and nine and whatever else it is. So you've got a decimal point that makes it much easier. Uh, this has the measurements on both sides, both arms here. On the back side, it's got three scales. It's got the front scale measurements. It's also got this scale on the top called the Kakumi scale, which is the front side measured multiplied by the square root of two. If you know geometry, that gives you the hypotenuse of an equilateral right triangle, which comes in very handy when you're laying out a hip rafter, which is a 45 direction on the corner of the roof when the rafter comes down to 45. So as you're measuring across this way, if you're measuring up the beam, you use the Kakume scale, and that will run in exactly square to where it was measured on the bottom. So this is kind of like the calculator for traditional carpenters. Uh, there's another scale on here that measures a circle like a log, and will tell you how big of a square post you could get out of that log. So the Japanese always use this. In the modern times, they've gone to centimeters and millimeters because for some strange mathematical quirk, all their measurements of, of millimeters line up with the shaku in the, in the booth. 
where if you use inches, when you use inches, they're close.